they are choosing to be there. And why, why, you know, does the fit? We have to choose that because when you go in in the car, you don't feel it. You even put air conditioner, you know, and you go faster. No, you got to take the risk with the people. Yeah. But then at the time, you know, I was so thankful for the Methodists. I even wish, as irreverent as I am, to have been a Methodist. I had even wished that the Methodists were in my country instead of the American Baptists. <laughs> because they couldn't figure out what was going on. In the Holy Donut, they couldn't come together with a position, even though they were the major denomination in El Salvador and in Nicaragua. And because the American Baptists and diplomacy amongst the denominations, you know, they couldn't decide, the American Baptists, if there was a war in Nicaragua and there was a war in El Salvador. So in the Committee for Latin America and the Caribbean, the Methodists took a position to do the work, the Presbyterians too, and the Lutherans. But the American Baptists couldn't. So continue to be killed because you couldn't do all that you could do. You see, this is the witness. And, and, and you know, like any time, any of us could be killed in our country. And so I say, oh, I used to talk with God and say, look, I don't like, why in the world did you send the Baptist here, caramba? I said, why didn't you at least send the Methodists are sinful and drinking and dancing and smoking as they are? Because the Baptists did. But then when I came to study in the US, my roommate got pregnant and I didn't even understand what was going on. And then used to drink and smoke outside and you know in the school that I went at is American Baptist, you know, the big thing that they did during the, that time uh, when I was studying was the Vietnam War. They had a big demonstration, put a bag over their heads and cross the street from our school. And you know what was the demand? It was another, you know, I was marching with Martin Luther King and I was working with Cesar Chavez and I was with the independentist movement of Puerto Rico. But my compañeros and compañeras at school, they put those bags in their, in their faces, and they cross the street to demand the right to smoke <laughs> on campus. <laughs> and that was a big thing there. <laughs> you see what I mean? And you might say, what does this have to do with what we are talking about here? <laughs> People's lives are in danger. Mm. Quality of life, you know? But then, you know, we don't have to massage God at all. Not with songs. Not with dances, not with prayers, not with candles. Do right, God says. Mm. And the whole world is going to, I'm sorry to say it in this place, but nothing is sacred to me but life. Mm. The whole world is going to help. Syria, forget it. We don't have time. Iran, huh, that guy is very bad. Oh, good that Hugo Chavez is dying. Well, you know, Hugo Chavez, we know he's in ignorance and weaknesses and whatever, he's doing much more. He has done much more than anybody else. And I have prepared to work with you about what is it that we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be and we are called to be salt of the earth and light in the world. And we cannot do it. Oh yes, I'm going to be, you know. The church has to prepare you for that. And believe it or not, the political party too. But then the church people have to be prepared to make it sure that the party does it. So I don't like it when people tell me, and I, because I am demanding of people here to really get that Congress and that Senate to do what they have to do. When they keep talking right before Christmas about $400,000 and taxes when my people cannot eat, and all of us who are in the churches, and you know, we are with the uh, Millennium Development Goals. Oh, so many people in the world don't even have one dollar per day. And they are talking about 400 million, you know, taxes to some people, and oh, the middle class, mediocre class, mediocre mm. class. And my country, they go in the same direction. That's middle class, mediocre. They just cannot think, but with this. This is what let them think. And you just see how terrible it is to be out there. Because any time, you know, anything can blow up. Right now, 
the day before I left, the last discussion that was on TV was things are getting so bad that we can have a bloody war, not a revolution, a bloody war between the ones that think that they have the power now and the ones that think that they lost it. And then I got, you know, I don't like tweets and I don't like Facebook, it doesn't make things, I don't like it. But because people now can only read 140 characters, oh, I pray, give me a chance to say what I have to say, send it to people. So I wrote this thing, you know, I wrote, you know, how many of you know about Mercedes Sosa, the senior? Yeah. And she had this beautiful song that said, <clears throat> I only ask of God not to Dios. be indifferent to death, you know, and to violence and to injustice. So I, I, got, I got this one that said, I only ask of God, and this 140, you know, characters, <laughs> that I not be indifferent to corruption. <gasps> you just see all the mail. <laughs> That's so bad. What's wrong with you? You are doing the work of the ultra right because you better be quiet. Because you now we have the right government, and they are going to take us to where we have to go. No, we go together. We work with them. We accompany the people. You see, and so meditation for me has to be healing. Okay, and then you know I wrote another one, and I, this one I prepare for you. Can you imagine in the middle of the night I'm speaking? What is the next tweet that I have to send? <laughs> that, that, that it has to be sent because it has to be with what's going on. A hundred and sixty years celebration in Cuba for Mar uh, Jose Martí, Marti. the poet, all kinds of conferences, discernment, real meditations. No, but we don't see because they are communists. You know, what some people told me is, People, Christians, don't like the rapping that God makes, you know? But you learn a lot. And Jose Martí was the one that created the consciousness about doing the changes that were needed in Cuba. And that has been a light. And for those of you from Africa, how many people have you had that have come to teach, to read, and write, and medicine, and hospitals, and all kinds of things? Even, but I don't like what? Going there to fight for crimes. So Jose Martí worked for kids. And they, you know, he made little stories for kids. That was special for me because I worked with young people and kids. And it was books of the golden age. He said, the real revolution cannot happen, the real change, if we don't work with the little kids. But he wrote a poem that I have known from the time I was little. And I have prepared to be with you in that circle. So it's the white rose. You know, I know that white has the connotations in this country, and because of that all over the world, we have to be mindful, you know, the white. But this is a gift that 160 years ago, more or less, he wrote. And he said the white rose. And I tell you, it has so much meaning because he says, cultivo una rosa blanca. En julio, como en enero, para el amigo sincero que me da su mano franca y para el cruel que me arranca el corazón con que vivo, cartón y ortiga, cultivo, cultivo una rosa blanca. Now, you know, you have to say with, you know, that power. So when I say it to the kids, I just don't say it like that. I say, hey, yo cultivo una rosa blanca en julio, como en enero, para el amigo sincero que me da su mano franca. Y para el cuerpo que me arranca, el corazón con que vivo, yo cultivo una rosa blanca. Cardo, mi ortiga, cultivo, cultivo una rosa blanca. Y no, ortigo, uh, or, ortigo, and um, he's talking about thorns, you know, something that can hurt somebody. So he says that in January and July, he cultivates, and cultivate is not the same thing as planting. You can plant and no water, and you know, it won't get anywhere. He cultivates a white rose for the good friend that extends his or her hand to him. And for the cruel that takes away the heart with which he lives, he doesn't cultivate, you know, thorns, but he cultivates a white rose. 
And to me, this is the work that we have to do. This is the work of the Methodist Church. And we are giving the great opportunity to prepare something because you were giving witness. And I am concerned that the National Council of Churches that always also had been at the forefront of so much is closing the offices. Mm -hmm. It's closing mm -hmm. the offices. And they are, yeah, starting at the end of this month. And they are moving a little office to Washington. And voila, Washington office of Latin America, very stinkingly, is still there working. And when the government in my country was trying to close and tie the hands of the uh, Court of Constitutionality so that the president would have to get permission, give permission to the Court of Constitutionality to say that something, a law was you know, constitutional or not, we fought against it. And do you know who helped us? Voila. The United Nations, Amnesty International. So I was there at 3, 3 a.m. writing all this stuff and sending all this stuff out and saying, look, don't believe me, come and see. And finally, a position was taken. What I was, the Washington Office of Latin America is the committee that the churches have created to follow Latin America, you know? And so when they finally took a position, the president started to back out. But they, they, they haven't changed, they're still trying to do that. Now, the Washington office on Africa is closed. The Washington office on Asia is closed. And look, the mining and all the destruction is going on all over the world. We need to do our work, brothers and sisters. We need to. Otherwise, don't massage God. Just go and get all you, the stuff you want and leave your life here. At least enjoy it the way you want it here because people are having it very tough, and it's really very dangerous. So I wanted to thank you for the testimony you gave, because I, I don't know what you're going to do. I hope that you really have this good talks with God and say, oh. you know, because I had to drop out of school. I was finishing my training at the seminary in, in the doctoral program. Monsignor asked me to go, and I came back, I closed everything, and I went. And people said, but don't you see that your daughter and all this, and you should return? This is the best I have done with my life. Yes. I will never, never be bad about it. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about, you know, getting, uh, you know, put in jail, it's not the same thing as when we get put in jail. Right. <laughs> I said, this is my last day, I thought one day, you know, when they picked me up. And I saw myself even trying to flee, but I also saw the big dogs that were going to run after me, and I also saw the big matching guns. <laughs> so I said, this is awful. And then I saw this young man that probably would be the one in our country, people, especially political people, are not just detained and put in jail. We get tortured, and the most tortured for women are rape and all kinds of terrible things. And I could see all that because I knew. So I had to tell myself, why are you so scary now that you want to be on your back, son? Why are you trembling here? Didn't you know that this could come? Mm -hmm. And then I knew. I made this choice knowing that this could happen. Mm -hmm. And then I said, yeah, but I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't help now. And then I saw this young man, you know. I mean, believe it or not, he is holding that so much in God, like if he had a baby standing in front of me, with his hair sticking like that. Very indigenous young man. And I know why indigenous young people have to get into the army, because it's the way to get some money for the family. And then when I saw that, I said, that's the reason I decided to join you, in spite of this. I want this to change. So have the strength to face it now. You made this choice. So I'm asking all of us, you know, you might think, ah, we have very few. You're only few if you don't want to be the many. You don't know how far we can go. But we got to make the choices. And we cannot continue to look the other way around when they're discussing about, oh, we are going to make a law so that only guns that can shoot 15 people instead of 30. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what in the world the Greek was talking about? <laughs> And I pray for you. 
every day at 4 30 in the morning. I used to pray for Bush because I said he can only go how far he is. But we have prayers and we have hearts, and you know, the problem is that people are not seeing. So we got to be the salt of the earth, and Mother Earth can't stand it any longer. Cannot stand it any longer. My mom used to, used to tell me, don't tell me, because I came from school, the Christian school, you know, around fourth grade, and I told my mom, Mama, water is a mineral. <laughs> my mom said, water is alive. It's the vital liquid. It's sacred. No, Mama. It's a mineral. And minerals don't fill. They are just like the stones. And who told you that the stones don't fill? Everything is alive in the universe, Martita. Mm. And I thought, I met my mama, only went to third grade. She said, teacher, no woman, she doesn't know. And I know that she's right. And the earth is claiming and calling us in every instance to pay attention, to see, and to respond. So we are to be the soul of Mother Earth. And don't tell me that you come from a different culture and you cannot say Mother Earth. <laughs> Check it out. No, oh, no, I am a scientist. I, can, I have to see it from distance. Yeah, uh-huh. And don't tell me that we cannot be the light of the world. We can and we must. So I am prepared to do this, but I am angry right now. <laughs> I am angry that I have to talk like this with you. When I would like to just be partying and dancing with you. We have been born to enjoy life. And so, you know, I think that we have to create the conditions that we really have heaven on earth. We have to. And we have to do the work of ecumenism, as weak as it might be. We have to do the accompaniment. It's accompaniment. We are not going to free anybody, thanks God. They free themselves. And I agree with this. I, I have been going with the, you know, the UN created these um, MDGs, the Millennium <laughs> Development Goals, and didn't consult anybody. And it was nice. They are kind of nice, good tools, leverage things. But you know what? They found out that they didn't ask anybody, so now they decided to have 50 countries where they are going to do some consultations. And it happened that El Salvador is one of them. So I volunteered to go to the consultation. And it's very hard. But I volunteered not to go where the people knew me. I thought this is the time to go where the people don't know and far away. So I've been going to the farthest places. The first, the first that we had was all indigenous people. I said, I'm only going to do it with the people that never are taken into account. This post 2015 is to correct the exclusion. So I'm going to go to indigenous peoples, to the youth, to the women in the market, you know, to uh, the students, and like that. And they said, okay. They probably thought it is too to do it. And I developed a team of young people, and we've been going. The first one was to visit with the indigenous people. And I tell you, I put the sign that we have painted and all that, very nice. And then I start explaining about the Millennium Development Goals and post 2015, and that this is a consultation which you have seen. I am so proud of it. I'm so proud because the people got up and they insulted me. <laughs> yes. They told me, what? And you coming now to tell us? Only now? And you know, and I thought, no, I said, God, I'm very glad that they don't beat me up. <laughs> they were all very angry. And they stood up and they told me, don't tell me, don't tell us that this is a consultation. This is the first time we are hearing about it. Yeah. Nobody came to tell us. What is the government doing? Well, that's why we're coming, to so we can run to the government. Well, don't you go and use my name and my signature and my ID. Because this is no consultation. And I'm writing all this and I'm going to put it. And I need all of you to really press for the event that is coming in September. So because we are doing it like this, you know, they change. The UN change how the consultation is going to be. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not going to be. Oh, but it's, look what they did. No, no, no. You shouldn't bother too much. That's too much work. We are going to give you this thing and there is going to be the skeleton of a fish. This is the fish diagnosis, 
okay? You can make diagnosis with the fish. So here is the tail, and here is the head. And here is, you know, the skeleton, the rest of the skeleton. So you talk with the MDGs about all the bad things that happen with nature and with hunger and poverty and all that. And then you say how you want it. You put it in the head. And in between, how you're going to correct it. And then you give it to us, and we'll write the report. I'm writing my own reports. You see, and that's why we have to talk about transparency, accountability, and if we are really going to be about what we are saying that we are going to be, we don't have to be about the poor, but we really have to work about the impoverishment, because it's a mechanism of impoverishment. People don't want to be called the poor, or the disadvantaged, or, you know, all kinds of things that we name them. The least industrialized nations and the least, and the least so-called developed countries, they are to be for us where we see ourselves in that mirror, in the indigenous people in the world, First Nations. So I hope that this was not a meditation because I hope that you go sick. I don't want you to be healed. Go and bother everybody that you can. And don't you get too far away and come and visit me. I don't invite too many people to visit me. <laughs> I want to see what you're doing, Jim. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm sorry that I had to be like this. But you know, who else is going to come from there and tell you this? <coughs> so thank you. I don't know if we have to say a prayer, but no. this is also the, the way I pray with God. You know, I tell God the truth, and I say, it's time. It's time that we have the strength to go. Let's stop being sheep. If anybody would like to make a prayer or say something, it's okay. I have, I have done what I need to do. Amen. Let's pray. You pray? Can I pray? Lead us into a prayer? You can pray. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this moment. We thank you, Father, because you have called us as the sort of the word and the light and darkness. We thank you for your message, your word that has come from your daughter, O oh God. We pray, Father, that as we leave from this place, that, Lord, you will give us the inspiration, you will give us the energy to do what you have called us to do as your witnesses on the face of the earth as the sword and the light in darkness. We just thank you for this message. We thank you for this event. We thank you for every one of us who have come from, from all around the world to be part of this global movement of God. We thank you for even the outcome of this document. The Lord is, will be very useful in, in organizing, in advocacy, in education, in, in the kind of work, Father, that you have called us to do. We bless you for the agency, the General World Church of Society, its leadership. We just thank you, Father, that you continually give them the inspiration, the wisdom, the knowledge, even the board of God, that we all be supportive of this work so that we can bring change our own world. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you. Mr. Levi, thank you very much. I know that this is not easy, but I will continue to love you. <laughs> <laughs>